Well, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thanks for the honor uh, and greetings from India, a country which is not very far from here and with which, of course, the Arab world has enjoyed close relations and we have, of course, enjoyed close relations for, for centuries. A country where economic growth is the mantra every Indian is wedded to where hunger for natural gas will soon break all previous records and future demand projections being made by various agencies and houses and think tanks. You know, this, those projections probably will also get a big surprise because in my view, in a country where 700 million people are still not part of the gas economy, and they're eager to join, and the government facilitating it, I think the demand for natural gas in India is going to be much, much higher than projected by any think tank, any organization, or any consulting firm. And India, where the demand for oil has already overtaken China, where growth in renewables is setting a new world record, where renewable energy Goal, for instance, at present is 175,000 megawatt by 2020. And where renewable energy is taking the shape of a grassroots revolution. Grassroots revolution. You can see it across the country, wherever you go. Yet, where oil and gas are not dirty words. Where natural gas is treated as a sunrise industry with a lot of hope, with a lot of enthusiasm, and with tremendous planning. Where oil is respected, I repeat, where oil is respected as a blessing to mankind and an asset which is strategic. And where global, where a big global natural gas market is fast taking shape. So these are the things, these are the developments which are taking place not very far from Qatar. And India, my country, where the transition process from hydrocarbon economy to a renewable-based economy, including nuclear, would probably go on for many decades, probably until 2080. It's not going to be a shift. We will consume more coal, we will consume more oil, and we are going to consume more natural gas for decades to come. At the same time, we will be doing everything possible in renewable, because demand for energy in India is going to surprise even the most optimist, even the best equipped analyst. Take it from me. I travel across the country and I know what is actually coming. And at the same time, where gas and oil will remain central, central to India's growth for several decades to come. What we are trying to do in India is to shift to a sustainable gas-based economy, a densely populated country with home to 1.27 billion women, children, and men has clearly no other option. Coal is too polluting, we know that. But we are going to use coal also for a very, very long time. And a big share for renewables in India's energy mix is still several, several decades ago. I mean, we are investing a lot, we are working in that direction, but at the same time, when you look at our demand requirement and also bringing, pulling those people up who are below energy poverty line into the energy mainstream, that's going to require us practically every single source of energy that's available or that is known to humankind. Therefore, our focus is on natural gas and, of course, also on oil. Now, today, in 2016, this is the order. Natural gas first, oil after the rest. Because next 40, 50 years, we are building an economy which is going to be largely and broadly gas-based. Gas today accounts for about 9% of India's energy mix. Some people say 9.7, while oil accounts for more than 25%. But this is all set to change. However, with gas occupying probably the the biggest share in India's energy in the coming few decades. In India, as oil production stagnates 
and gas production decrease, a large share of total consumption of natural gas has to be imported. And the same goes for oil. India's dependence on imported oil is going to go up from 80% to about 92% in coming years. The gap between domestic gas production and consumption is expected to increase from 19 BCM to 82 BCM by 2035. But these are the assessments and projections given by some well-known international agencies. My own assessment is that actually demand is going to be much, much more if we have to bring every single Indian of these 700 million who are not part of the natural gas economy into the gas economy. We are going to need much, much more than this projection. However, however, there are a few issues what I would like to underline here. India, China, Japan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and I'm sure all other importers want to see a stable and peaceful Middle East. Asian, and oil, Asian oil and gas importers are among the biggest stakeholders in the present and future of the Middle East, which is hugely blessed by God with so much of wealth, with so much of talent, and with so much of beauty. But let me be honest. Disturbances in the Middle East do disturb us, the importers, the big consumers, forcing us to diversify our supply sources of oil and gas to other regions, to Africa, to Australia, and to even far away Latin America and the United States. We are building seven LNG ships just to bring LNG from the United States. I wish, and I repeat, I wish we don't have to do that. We all must ensure a peaceful Middle East and a golden future for the entire Middle East. We, India, we, the consumers of oil and gas, are with you, behind you on this because what you have to offer is extremely precious for us and extremely critical for our future, for our children, for our economy, for all those who live below poverty line. A few lines about, a few thoughts on prices. In my view, high oil and gas prices are bad for emerging economies like India and China, and for that matter, other economies. But the prices that are too low are also bad. India's exports have suffered due to lower revenues in the Middle East. Our exports to the Middle East have suffered. Our exports to other parts of the world have suffered because of oil prices that are too low. Global economy has suffered due to lower energy prices. And the fear, and the fear that low prices could lead to economic and social distress in the Middle East give us trust me when I say that, give us sleepless nights, because we can't afford that. We can't afford that. We want prices of energy, particularly oil, that are not too high, that are not too low. For oil, just a thought, a price in the region of the US dollar 55 to 60 dollar per barrel should be a win-win for all. That's how we look at it. We hope that an Asian gas order should soon be in place, which could bring stability in prices for both producers as well as consumers, so that both producers and consumers can plan their future accordingly. The Global Oil and Gas Gravity Center, and this is a major shift which has happened, the Global Oil and Gas Gravity Center has already moved from the Atlantic to Asia. It's a reality now. And in my view, this will be an Asian century as far as oil and gas are concerned. This will be an Asian century. But at the same time, at the same time, this will also be an Africa century for oil and gas, beginning 2025, because Asia particularly economies like India and China, will peak by 2050, and we will still have 50 years to go of this century. So the gravity center will move to Africa. The Middle East, this part of the world, can be the bridge between Asia 
and Africa can be a bridge and can be a force to make this happen, can be a force. And in the process, the Middle East can benefit from it, profit from it, and do wonderful service to the humankind. The Middle East future is tied more with Asia today. And I repeat, Middle East future is tied more with Asia today and Africa tomorrow than any other continent, than any other continent. Thanks for this opportunity. God bless your country, God bless Qatar, and God bless the Middle East. Thank you.